but also questions about you know animals because animals are always killed with these things. And it makes no sense to me. You know, a black lab is. I mean, anyone that's ever had a black lab just knows that that's absurd. They're 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 literally made to pick up things and not harm them as they deliver them to you. Um, you could give them your arm to bite on and it won't hurt you. Uh, they try, but it's it's not. They're not made that way. But I mean, they can use pepper spray. They could grab them by the collars and pull them into the back um, into the bathroom. There's other things they can do. But any dog, you can have other you know things in place. Standards dealing with dogs are something obviously to my family is something very very important to us as well. But standards only begin only grow grow out of an actual set of information. Uh, three going into oversight. Um, you know, being you know a, I guess a victim. Of the, you know, of a, of a box that would buy um, I, I have that vantage point, but I also have the vantage point of the mayor of my town. I've been mayor of the town of Berwyn Heights for five years, um, and that's quite an education. I mean, it's it's uh, you know, I was when I was elected, I was actually the youngest mayor in the state of uh, Maryland. I'm not even, I'm not like the fifth fifth youngest in Prince George's County now, which is kind of funny. But uh, I, I've learned a lot in that time frame, and I've been in a position where you've had to discipline. Police. And, and I have a remarkable respect for the job that they do. And it's not an easy job. And, and you know, obviously, Berwyn Heights has, we're relatively set with record low crime rate last year. We're a lot safer and a lot different than Prince George's County Police, which are dealing with some very difficult issues. And they have challenges that they have to meet. But you also have to understand that the nature of a culture that, you know, it's sort of it's us versus them. There's sort of a natural griping that occurs. People don't understand. And you're probably right. We don't fully understand. but. Without oversight, the consequences that, that, that result are profound. Because if you do not discipline an officer for violating procedure, they then do something more severe. If you do not discipline or take action as a police officer for, say, filing a false statement, um, which is a fireable offense, and they can, can't be, once they do that, they can't be a police officer anymore, if you catch them and follow through. But we have, in Prince George, actually, in the state of Maryland, Police Officers' Bill of Rights, that really gives protections to police officers that far exceed what average ordinary Americans get. In the military, to make that connection, military actually have a standard of justice. The bar is a lot lower if you can rent an offense in the military. For police officers, for misconduct, the bar is actually fairly higher. Uh, if you shoot someone, or if you discharge your weapon, the way they, you know, or if you have a complaint filed against you, the way that they they have like 15 days to respond. They can do it in writing. Only then can you talk to them. There's a whole series of procedural barriers that really do temper and mitigate the oversight that they receive. But oversight of police officers is a very difficult thing. And I think there's this assumption out there that police represent public safety. And I don't think that's any more true than teachers who represent education. It's just, you know, obviously they're an important stakeholder, but they're not the only stakeholder. And there has to be mechanisms of demanding oversight. Against my bill, which I'm sadly to me, very sadly to me, the, the Prince of Peter King, the State of Maryland, uh, Chiefs of Police, Sheriff's Association, the Paternal Order of Police, all opposed the transparency legislation, which is a fairly low threshold. And that was disturbing to me. And I, I, I applaud the Maryland State Legislature for passing the bill over those objections, because they testified in both chambers and the bills got out of both committees unanimously. But the arguments that they made were incredibly disturbing. I mean, the argument that basically what they said is only police can oversee police officers. These are operational matters, and it has to be left to themselves. And I think that's a frightening, chilling conception. The notion that you can't criticize someone because you're not one of them. You know, if we left it up, you know, it, when you leave it up to the professions, I mean, I guess if we left it to the banks to oversee themselves, maybe something would go wrong in the banking industry. You know, it's, <laughs> you know, it's that worldview, but they, I think they believe it. And you don't see... The pushback, and I think the pushback is necessary because the the, the oversight, you know, the the, the the oversight really dictates what happens forward. Which brings me to my final point, which is the elected leadership, is that the reluctance of elected leaders to sort of stand out and speak up on these issues is 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 difficult. It creates a challenge when you have sort of the, the reflexive response of the county executive is to defend your police officers. Um, you know. Clearly, they were doing it for the right. The guys do what they were supposed to do. I mean, they, they, they basically cleared them of wrongdoing publicly before they actually did an investigation, before they spoke to my family. Because that's sort of a reflexive thing. The Prince George's County Council to this day has not had a hearing on public safety abuses and problems. And my, my case is one of many, many examples that don't just extend to the 
police and sheriff's department, but also the corrections, which, you know, uh, the Ronnie White situation where he was uh, found dead, you know, in prison uh, the next day after uh, an event. Um, and we just got out, you know, Prince George County Police just got out from underneath an FBI oversight process that lasted better than a decade. Um, but you don't see the leadership not demonizing, because I actually, I, I'm very strong and I don't want to, I don't want to say that it's the people who came through the door, even the people, maybe the three officers who fired the guns in my home. I don't know enough about them or know enough about the circumstances under which they were operating. I don't know what they were told. That's why I'm trying to get information. I, I think it's easy to blame the front line folks. Uh, they, you know, they were told they were fighting a war and I was a drug dealer and they had to take me out. And they did. I blame the people who called them in, who failed to, to properly train the people that hired, who maybe didn't hire that well, but more importantly, who failed to establish the leadership at the high levels of the organization um, or the high levels of the county government that, that you know, it, that kind of authorize, give people badges and a special trust and let them go off and do their work. And so ultimately, it's the people we elect who are accountable to us, but that's the process that takes getting more information out there that takes holding elected leaders accountable, but also asking hard questions of them. Because it's really difficult. And I remember this when I was a newly elected 33-year-old mayor. Challenging my police officer, you know, my police chief, on an operational matter was not an easy thing to do. Uh, it, it was something that we had to develop a relationship. It was something I had to learn a lot. I was not prepared at that moment to take him on on something where we disagreed. And a lot of times, a lot of my ideas, they were sort of, you know, they were wacky and probably wrong. And a lot of his, same way, we eventually, over time, reach that relationship. But at the end of the day, he works for me. Anything he does, I authorize. And if I fail to hold him in line, that's my responsibility. But when you say the guys did what they were supposed to do, that sends a remarkably chilling message to every single officer oper operating then, operating today, and operating tomorrow, that that type of behavior is okay, it will be condoned, and there won't be consequences for it. And it almost ensures that it will happen again. Um, and so, you know, part of my obligation, I guess, going forward is to try to tell the story, but talk about these issues. I'm still thinking of them. I'm not going to stand here tonight and, or sit here tonight and tell you that I have all the answers. I don't. And this has been a process and a personal journey for me. I'm trying to be rational about it. Um, and when I talk to people, I'm trying to get them to think about it, too, and hopefully engage in conversation. That's what, you know, meetings like this to do. That's what the legislation will do, and hopefully that's what another bill that takes the next step along this path in Maryland will do. I'm hopeful that um, other states might use what, we, what we're hoping you know, the governor will sign here in Maryland as a model. And I think there's certainly things that can happen at the federal level as well. So my hope is that this is a journey that we're actually going to get somewhere that will open up a conversation about SWAT teams, yes, but also about the type of policing we want, about the type of policing that is proactive, forward-leaning rather than the reactive, get the bad guys after the fact, we're going to end up incarcerating lots of people and we've seen that that seems to be the best, you know, the best public policy objective to the problems that we're facing. I, I, I just think it's got to be a better way. So with that, I'll conclude my remarks and, and uh, look forward to questions.